The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verana Media Network. This is an opinion-based program. This is Other Than 24. Tonight, as the country slowly gears up for a presidential election, key demographics too are preparing its push for its party. The women's wing of the Sri Lanka Podujana Perumana recently held its convention, very well knowing the candidate they are backing this time around. However, the opposing United National Party remains in the dark with no candidate in sight. How can the party prepare for the upcoming polls? Will it be too late? What kind of an impact can women make on the final result? being the largest eligible voter group in the nation. Will they be silent deciders or will they opt to be very vocal? For insight and analysis on the women's vote, tonight the guests are attorney at law Lihiri Fernando, municipal councillor at the Moratua Municipal Council representing the United National Party and Shermila Rajapaksha, member of the Vietmag Initiative closely following the SLPP campaign. You are with Sri Lanka's only news channel. It's time to get real. A very good evening to everyone joining us today. I'm Daniel Tanawasam sitting in for Mahesh Joni who is on a break this week. I'm joined tonight by two individuals representing the women's population of the country. I'm honored to welcome back attorney at law Lihini Fernando, a municipal councillor at the Morto Municipal Council from the United National Party. And also joining us tonight is Shermila Rajapaksha, a member of the Vyatmag Initiative, closely following the SSPP's presidential campaign. Let us move directly into the crux of our discussion by providing some context onto the core issue. Based on the media population estimates conducted by the Census and Statistics Department of Sri Lanka, 8.47 million women will qualify as voters for the upcoming election. This is 52.29% of the total population eligible to vote. It's quite obvious we don't see this representation in Parliament as only 12 members were elected. We haven't seen this in provincial councils either since only 434 provincial council members are male with only 21 that are female. Today we are here to get some insight as to how much of an impact women will be making in the upcoming presidential election. Shermila, I want to um, start with you. Uh, with the recent revelation of how elections are going to be and the presidential election that is coming up, I want to ask you, what exactly should be the next president's biggest priority as a woman? What do you think the biggest priority should be for the next president? Um, so the biggest priority in today's context uh, for a candidate would be, I would say, the national security. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, everyone suddenly uh, uh, woken up after the April 21st uh, bomb blast. Uh, we were all like very comfortable and uh, we had the uh, ability to criticize and say whatever it is, what we need, the luxuries that we want, because the national security, it's kind of like the foundation of our economy and of our country. So that was set. All of us were in our comfort zone. And all of a sudden now that is challenged. Mm -hmm. So for, uh, for us to do anything, even to develop economy, talk about democracy, uh, talk about women's rights, empowerment or entrepreneurship or environmental rights, anything. I think the national security is the utmost important thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the very first priority for, a, uh, for our next candidate will be uh, the national security. Mm -hmm. So as long as, uh, because at the moment no one is sure because uh, uh, there is no certainty as to who at least, who at least committed this crime, mm -hmm. right? So there was no identification. So at one point they claim, okay, this group did that. And after a certain while they say, okay, it is not that group who did that. So it's like, okay, uh, some terrorist group has come. So whether mm -hmm. we don't know whether it's internal or external. So um, everyone's concern is that. So mm -hmm. that would be, uh, according to my analysis and understanding, mm -hmm. the pulse of the people, I think it's national security. Mm -hmm. 
So, Lihini Shamila says accountability is one issue and national security. That should be the priority. Do you, before we move into anything more detailed, do you think that is, um, as a woman, as a woman parliamentarian, um, a person who has been in politics for some time, you've been dealing with people for a long time, should there be a different priority to this? Or should this be the key concern when it comes to people today and women today in our country? Yes. Uh, let me touch base on that. Before that, let me. I want to thank uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Get Real program for having me here and mm -hmm. for giving the, this platform to raise some concerns about the concept of women in politics per mm -hmm. se. Let me first touch base a little bit on uh, what you said uh, initially at the beginning. So this whole concept of women in politics per se and the representation of women in Sri Lanka, I think, is a topic which is quite vital and I think which needs more and more discussion in the present context. And also since we are in this whole election, election phase. Now, women per se is 52% of the population. Yeah. If you take the registered voters, women contributes to about 56% of the population. Mm -hmm. And if you take the university education, there are about 50% of women in university education. And if you take the franchise right, we get the women get the franchise right in Sri Lanka in 1931. Mm -hmm. That is about three years after uh, Great Britain and about 10 years after US. So we get the franchise right in 1931. But in present context, I, I'm actually to say, I'm a little sad to say this, mm. but if you take parliament, it's only female representation is only 6%. 6%. Before 2018, the local government women representation was 1.9%. Mm -hmm. And in provincial councils, it was 4%. And uh, after the 2018, uh, the, the local government elections was brought in. This was a ra raised to 25%, which I would say that was also after bringing this women's quota. Mm -hmm. We'll have to talk about that yeah. in detail. So now, if you look at it now, if you compare Sri Lanka with the Southeast Asian region, and if you take India per se, India, there's women representation of 12%. And if you take uh, countries like US, it's about 30, uh, 25%. And the Europe's, it's about 26%. So if you take the region per se, women representation is above 15%. But here we are, after producing the first woman prime minister in the world, mm -hmm. we are at 6%. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to ask this question. Now, women are a key decisive factor in decision making because women play a pivotal role in shaping the economy, in shaping the family, in shaping the education of, the next, of, of our next generation, of our children. So, shouldn't women be in this decision making platform? Mm -hmm. Now, if you take, uh, if I'm to bring you a little bit of, on global statistics, mm -hmm. on the International Interparliamentary Un Union, Sri Lanka is ranked at 182 mm -hmm. in terms of women representation in parliament. So, now these, these kind of factors are things I think, I don't know whether we have failed to see that women representation, whether it's important or whether it's not important. I'd like to say now Sri Lanka ratified the CEDAW Convention, the Convention of Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, in 1981. Mm -hmm. Now, in the, when, we, when you ratify a con, con, convention, you are agreeing to the preambles, the laws that are elaborated on the convention. But however, whatever that was stated in the CEDAW Convention, has it been transformed into national law? Now, if I may bring in to, bring to, to uh, articles of the CEDAW Convention, now Article 4 says mm -hmm. about non-discrimination against women and men. So, with non-discrimination. Now, now, if there is non-discrimination against women and women in political representation, should, should there be discrimination? Should there be non-discrimination? And also, Article 7 of the CEDAW Convention clearly states about the right to decision-making for women. So, the women should have the right to vote and the right to participate in formulating government policy. Mm -hmm. So, there, here we go. The CEDAW Convention, which Sri Lanka has ratified in 1981, which clearly says that women should be a part of the political governance and, and the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. But however, as, at Sri Lanka at present, where do we stand? So this is, I think, uh, in terms of shaping the economy and in terms of shaping Sri Lanka. And it also, if we look at the present political context, I would say, now we are blaming that whoever is in 225, that they are not, this is a, this is a common sentiment, that they are they ready to govern us. But this is a, just a question. Had we had 20% representation in parliament, let's say 50 women, would the environment be different? Would the women thinking be different? Will women add certain change, certain dynamics to this whole political culture? Mm -hmm. So I would say in this present context, I think women plays a pivotal role. And the role of the, role of the woman 
needs to be taken in more seriously and I think women need to play a pivotal role in decision making and uh, I would like to say that going forward I think we need to focus and the, the legislature should consider in increasing this women women quota uh, which was brought in through the local uh, local government elections to 25 percent and I think mm -hmm. it should be extended to the provincial council and also to the parliament mm -hmm. simply because women need to be heard and women need to be in the decision making process. Mm -hmm. Also let me add, add a little bit there um, why this women quota or oh, I, I, oh, we are discussing on yeah, we'll, later. I was going to take okay. it as a different question. I right. want to uh, channel that same question to you Shamila now. There was a entire background when uh, this uh, women's quota was brought in through parliament and that discussion was there. Now, Lihini suggests that this should extend to both parliament and to both provincial council as well. Do you think a quota on women's representation or providing candidacy or making it a requirement to providing candidacy for a certain set of women? Do you think that's the way forward in terms of bringing women into parliament or bringing more politicians or women more engaged in this? Or is there another avenue that we should be taking? Um, Actually, it is sad uh, that we had to bring in a quota mm -hmm. because if you take the population, uh, the women uh, population is more than 51%. Yeah. I think Lihini uh, mentioned all the statistics at the moment. So if you take any industry from education to population to entrepreneurship to uh, contribution to the society, in all the aspects, the the women, uh, uh, the population or whatever it is, the number is higher, the contribution is higher. Mm -hmm. But still, um, I, I wouldn't blame it uh, on the people who are in power or on the, on the male uh, dominant society or whatever. I think women also are partly uh, responsible mm -hmm. because uh, uh, we, we don't have to wait until someone comes and give us a quota. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very sad situation. Uh, but to begin with, I would say, because since we are at only 5.3% in the parliament, uh, I would say that's a good start. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, that's, that shouldn't be the way, right? Uh, only thing is, even though there's a quota, now we saw the challenges that we had. So certain parties, uh, like they didn't allow the females to come forward. So there were uh, uh, females uh, who contested uh, for the election, but how many of them actually got elected, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, just because, okay, uh, there should be a quota, a group of women cannot just come forward and say, okay, come and vote for me, right? They had to have the right grooming, they had to have the right uh, training, mm -hmm. they had to have the uh, right uh, uh, the skills and abilities and empowerment to do such a job. Mm -hmm. So, actually, women is capable today because we are managing at home or our offices and everywhere. We do multitasking, right? We do make decisions. Uh, so even though we say it's a male dominant society or whatever it is, most of the decisions are being taken by females, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we have the ability to do that. Uh, only thing I would say the women have been like so engrossed with their day-to-day -day work or with children or family, their priorities are always something else. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have left it for the males to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I would say that's a good start at least. Um, now, but I see there is an increasing uh, interest from women. Uh, women are coming forward in different sides. Entrepreneurship, they're talking about environment, they're talking about rights, uh, things like that. So I think gradually it has to increase and it has to come within the society. That's the ideal solution. Um, but as I said, I'm happy that uh, we have started somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so to going into my next question, Lina, I believe I should give you some time to talk about the quota as well. Mm -hmm. Before I go into that, if you could uh, channel that and link that with this as well, why? Now, Shermila comes from a background where her party has now given a candidate to the people mm -hmm. for them to decide. Why should, the, this is like the crux of our debate as well, yes. uh, why should the women of this country vote for the UNP or the party that you are supporting, at which point there is no candidate they can support right now as well. Right. If you could extend the answer to when your government, when you, the government right. that you supported brought in this quota as well, right. uh, your ideas to that and the candidacy issue. Yeah, so this in 2008 to 18 for the local government election, the bill was passed in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, that was brought in, brought forward by the present uh, women's minister, Honorable Chandrani Bandara, and also a culmination of other ministers, including the opposition 
opposition where all women got together and said that we need to represent this 25% of women's quota needs to be brought in. So talking a bit about the quota, I think as a start uh, to help women get into this political stream, this quota needs to come in. But afterwards, I don't think this quota should be there right throughout because when women come into the stream, women work hard, mm -hmm. women prove themselves. I can say this with my personal experience at the mm -hmm. local government, where how women are very much involved in decision making, involved in debate, involved in a lot of groundwork, where they things don't need to come to them, but they go 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 in search of knowledge, how they are how they are interactive. So women and they are they work way, way much with the grassroots level. So when women come into this, women will work their share up, and also then at, after a certain point, this quota can be taken out. But initially, I would say to give that push, this quota needs to come because uh, if you actually look at the history in Sri Lanka, it's always the ladies who have come into politics, it's either through their fathers or through their mothers or through their relations. But independent women, like probably women like you and me, uh, we, I don't come from a political background. We only came into this because I had the will for passion to change and to stand for something that I believe, stand for the truth and justice, and also to represent the women's voice. So where many women who are not in this conventional politics need to come into this if we are to see some change. Now, if you're talking about, you were raising the point about the UNP, if I'm to say UNP as a party uh, is my, a party. My question then goes to why should a woman vote for, vote the, UNP? for the UNP? So UNP as a party works on certain principles. A party that is focused on policy in terms of long-term strategy, in terms of a vision for the country. And they will, I would say they will, they will follow the rule and they will go by they will go by the rule and do things according to a particular plan. One now, something what uh, what are the what are the few allegations that comes towards the government is things are not happening as fast as it should happen. So people want visible change. So I would say development, there are two forms of development. One can say infrastructural development and also there's sustainable development. But for a country to move forward, it needs to have a combination of infrastructural development as well as sustainable development. Now, this government, uh, say, has focused on this whole concept of sustainable development where they have brought in policies about uh, developing entrepreneurship, giving, building an entrepreneurial culture, like uh, pro programs like Enterprise Sri Lanka, where loan schemes were given to the youth, mm -hmm. and especially also loan schemes were given to the women to start off their self self uh, self uh, uh, occupy entre entrepreneurships where more autonomy was given. Also, things like the budget had allocated more funds for daycare facilities uh, for women to start off daycare facilities, uh, things like that to encourage women. So I would say UNP per se uh, focuses Sri Lanka on the whole broad aspects. So on a policy platform, I think we look at look at the country in the long term, not, mm -hmm. not on short, short, quick or election stints. So I think for any women, women who are analyzing the present political system needs to think, needs to think when I'm voting for a party, do I vote for a party that is with policy or do I vote for a party that is uh, that is with a regime, I would say, culmination of a certain few people mm -hmm. making the decisions or a party where there are a certain group of people, independent people who come from different knowledge backgrounds, diverse in policy, knowledge. Do we work, vote for the policy or do we vote to uh, mm -hmm. sustain an agenda of a certain family, I would mm -hmm. say? Uh, now, Shamila, you'll have to respond to those claims. But definitely, before, <laughs> definitely. Please give me a chance. Uh, uh, we'll have to go to a short break in a while, so we will get to take some time to respond to those uh, claims. Mm -hmm. Before that, uh, Shamila, could you tell us uh, why, what, why you think, before we go to these claims, why you think, in brief, why a woman voter should vote for the party that you're supporting or the candidate you're supporting, mostly the can you're behind the candidate mostly more than the party. Uh, why, why would you make that decision? Exactly. Actually, actually you, you said it right. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, most of us who are supporting uh, Mr. Gota Rajapaksha, we are not behind a party. Mm -hmm. right? He, he became the candidate of the SLPP on the 11th of August. Before that, he was an independent person. right? So we started uh, gathering around him uh, ever since we lost the election. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we saw, as a mother, I saw how the country is going backwards. Right? I was never interested in politics. All of a sudden, I woke up and I heard that, OK, the Geneva resolutions are passing, like our own people going to, a human, going to the Human Rights Council and passing resolutions 
violence against our own country, then only I woke up, right? So actually the, the team of people who are there, most of us, we, we have never been involved in politics. We have never been interested in politics. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden we had a realization, okay, we have to come forward and we have to find the right person who can take this country forward. Mm -hmm. So we, we rally, rallied behind Mr. Gotabi Rajapaksha, uh, irrespective of a party. So mm -hmm. we, we would uh, support him whether he's coming from SLPP or whatever it is. We are behind the party because, you know, as women, we don't usually just say things and go, you know, mm -hmm. your mothers or aunts or sisters, right? We want to get things done. We like when people do things, even in our, at our home. Even though the husbands or the fathers or the brothers do or not, we go and make sure that certain things are done. What mm -hmm. has to be done is done, right? So I am behind uh, uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha because uh, he has delivered. I think now enough talking, people can bring in policies and everything, we can add up things, copy paste things from here and there. What mattered, matters is the ability to deliver results, right? So as Lihili said, we saw like UNP had uh, like nice slogans and nice policies, Yahapalane and this and that. But did you have the ability to deliver? We had four and a half years uh, in power, mm -hmm. but we are actually, we have gone backwards more than I think 10 years from our economy and all the other socioeconomic factors. Mm -hmm. We'll talk. Yes, <laughs> yes. We'll uh, we'll respond to all claims, and uh, Shamila should respond to the entire culture of having a family being supported in the PP. Okay. We will we will do that. Okay. Uh, before doing that, we'll take a short break. You are with Gabriel. Stay tuned. You are back on Get Real, so there has been an exchange with regards to how the candidates are functioning and how the parties are functioning. I will have to go back to Shermila and ask a very brief question and then we'll let Lehin respond as well. With regards to this entire concept of having a family and then that family being governing under, say, let's say, a certain personality and having a sort of not a policy per se, but this fam the entire backing they have, the traction they have as a family is what is functioning and that what that is what is running for uh, the Gotabi Rajapaksa as well. What do you say to that claim? Um, I actually say that's a misconception, right? Uh, so uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, Mr. Gotabi Rajapaksha is uh, uh, Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksha's brother. Uh, but uh, I would say Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha, uh, SLPP elected him as the candidate because people were asking for him, right? So ever since we lost the election, uh, Vyatmaga, also the professionals, whoever who rallied behind him, uh, we believed that he has to become the next leader, not because he is the brother of uh, Mahindra Rajapaksha, but because what he has done to the country. Right? Uh, so there are certain misconceptions. They are a family, yes, uh, but they have delivered results, mm -hmm. right? They have done things for the country. They know the pulse of the people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so actually, if you take uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha and uh, if you take the leadership of SLPP, Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksha, both of them like complement each other very nicely. Uh, right, uh, Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksha has uh, the understanding of the political arena and he has the maturity and he, he has a lot of charisma, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so people uh, from the grassroots level, they love him, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, for what they have done. So especially women, women love him because uh, about 37% of the women in Sri Lanka are widows. Mm -hmm. I think most of them became widows uh, because of the war. Mm -hmm. So these are the people after 30 years long, after 30 years, they put a stop to that war, right? Mm -hmm. So the women, especially women are asking for them to come back mm -hmm. because women are, are, we are suffering here. Actually, I have a daughter. 
right? Uh, I am suffering, so uh, I am still uh, scared to send my daughter to school, right? And uh, and th these children, they are not uh, they are not like us when we were small. They're very advanced. They have access to everywhere in the world. Uh, she's like, why are we even staying in this country? Nothing is happening, mm -hmm. right? Uh, why don't they have anything else to show in the TV? Mm -hmm. uh, is that all uh, they have to do in the parliament? Uh, why can't the president control the people in the parliament? Those are the kind of questions that we get as mothers, right? Mm -hmm. So we need we need answers. I need a, a future, a, a secured, a protective future, a sustainable future for my child. So I think the mothers would want that to come back, what we had, mm -hmm. the security, the economic prosperity. So uh, it doesn't matter whether they are from one family or different families. Uh, so now is the time people have to leave behind this party perceptions or family perceptions and people have to objectively look at people, policies and what they have done, what they have mm -hmm. delivered. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that uh, we have to uh, give up on those misconceptions and look for the person and his abilities and capabilities. Mm -hmm. Lini, um, delivery, that is one of the highlights of what uh, Shamila is uh, suggesting. If you could uh, answer also, we see that a lot of men are making decisions with regards to what the country's uh, exact requirement is as well. Can I say, uh, can I suggest a statement saying politically both men and women have the same aspirations? On a, on a political platform? And you could respond to whatever Shamila has been saying until yeah. now. So, yeah, just starting off on the concept of delivered. Mm -hmm. So there are two ways of delivering, right? <laughs> you can either have development through democracy and you mm -hmm. can have development through dictatorship as well. Mm -hmm. So now, if you take uh, the previous uh, particular candidate to which Shamila was mentioning, uh, was it developed, was, was it delivered through democracy or was it delivered through dictatorship? I'd like to ask, go back and ask uh, when certain developments were done, was there a violation of fundamental rights of the people? Were overnight versions just broken down? Was people's needs taken into consideration? Was this development run, done through the conventional process? Were, were, these, uh, uh, were these projects passed and tendered? And did it, did it follow the due process? Mm -hmm. So if, it was, uh, if, it, if the due process was followed, when people follow the due process, is that the reason why the de delay in delivery? Mm -hmm. These are questions. So now, if you take the, if you take Sri Lanka per se, the administrative structure, there's a certain mechanism of how things happen. So if you are a person, if you are a party that follows the law, who abides by the law, will go by the law and deliver through the law. Mm -hmm. And does, does, does that mean inefficiency? Or this is a question that uh, I think a misconception that everybody is having. So if you take the UNP government, one of the things that people are saying at the moment, has, has they, have they delivered? I would say they have delivered to a larger extent. If you take the legal frame, if you take the policy frame, in terms of democracy, in terms of the laws, the RTI Act, the Right to Information Act, the independent commissions, things are happening. So people, today you and I can walk freely and we can exercise our democratic right. We can exercise our fundamental rights, which I think is important for a woman, for I being a mother, tomorrow I need to be able to walk in freely. I need to have that security. As much as we have security in the country, we need to feel free, not, not feel restricted. So development can happen in either way. So we people, as educated people, we need to think what sort of a leader do we want in this country? Do we want to go under that whole militarial dictatorship or do we want, a, do we want to be governed under policy and to be led the right way? Mm -hmm. Now, for example, if I'm to say, now, if you take the UNP government per se, in terms of policy, they've done a lot to the, through the Gamperalia project, where they have done, developed all the rural rural areas. A lot of money has been, uh, over, over 3,000 million has been invested, if my statistics are right, through the rural development, rural roads development, and also development of religious institutions, and also in terms of policy, new, new, fundamental, new uh, policy development, in terms of laws that have been brought in, in terms of employment law, in terms of... Uh, uh, rights of uh, rights of I would say human be rights of women and things like that. A lot of regulations have been brought forward. So these I think are very credible steps. I think the government has taken. So uh, women I would say women need to look at all this in an objective manner. So uh, looking forward, like going forward, oh, I can talk better if we had a candidate and if a candidate was nominated, probably with policy I can talk. <laughs> but uh, openly, if I'm saying on a policy point of view, UNP looks at it in the broader context and development, sustainable development. Mm -hmm. 
and also in terms of uh, the other point you raised was uh, with regards to women men and and the policies decided by men and mm. should politically do men and women have the same aspiration yes politically men and women uh, yes they have the same aspiration now, for example I, i'll talk a little bit about my ex experience at the municipal council now when women come into this particular uh, particular area era era uh, area of serving uh, women i would say are far more energetic far more aggressive far more uh, more hands on in working when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the active role in political participation but men how do these men perceive women how dis how how these women are being discriminated for example now when uh, with this quota when this quota when women were brought into the local government uh, though they were appointed by the list they use this connotation for me women saying that you all are ping mantri that means you have just given you have been just given this particular position that you don't deserve to be in this now is 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 the are these things right so how to what extent are these discriminating women now these are things that that nobody talks about in the open 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 arena i think that's a fundamental problem in bringing a quota in uh, not not the quota it's it's per se it's how women are perceived how this whole patriarchal culture i would say how women are perceived by men men also don't to an extent don't see that women have the ability and the capability to contribute towards decision making they don't see that women have the knowledge and the ability but if women can be mothers if women can be corporate leaders if women can be in key forums in decision making why not women be in politics because today i would say this uh, the present political situation for the uh, one of the reasons i would say we are in this is also maybe if there were more women governing i think we would at least women will alert i and i'm not saying that women are not corrupted no women are uh, we we may not women are not corrupted to a larger extent i'd like to say that uh, but uh, women will alarm when it comes to corruption women uh, in terms of bribing i don't think it's easy to bribe a women i'm not discriminating but per se uh, if you, in in that sense i i think in terms of bringing regulation in terms of bringing streamlining this uh, political scenario i think women can play a pivotal role mm -hmm. um uh, shamila i move back to you <laughs> firstly there was a suggestion that uh, this is a dictatorship or a sort of military sort of maybe like a soft dictatorship that is the kind of delivery that we had during the fascist regime so if you could touch on that and uh, if we move forward from this position and we ask ourselves now uh, lihini brought in the fact and we discussed the fact of a quota being there to bring women into politics what are the other measures the state can take and what are the other measures people can take to remove these red tapes in allowing women to come into decision making positions because we see a lot of women finding employment abroad for domestic jobs and we need to retain all of this talent all these skills in this country that is something that we can all agree on so what are the other given your experiences what are the other steps that women could take and if you could address uh, lini's claims as well um yes uh, i would start with uh, the claims uh, that mm -hmm. lini made but you know i don't want to go far because uh, then this will be another typical political, political debate yeah. or a conversation uh, so i would always like to stay away from those so as i said there are a lot of misconceptions right um uh, but with regards to she said now we have the democracy to walk in this country uh, but i would say we don't even have the democracy to go to the church and pray anymore right so what about walking at least mr gotabe rajapaksha established it established some walking paths and <laughs> we can walk now freely the, the all the walls and the limitations and all the boundaries have taken away so we were happy after 30 years all the barrier barricades and checkpoints and everything was taken away now you can't go into a hotel five star hotel without someone being touching your whole body right uh, so that's the kind of uh, democracy you know, this government has established <laughs> <laughs> right um, so that is why i say uh, uh, we have to we have to look at the reality that we are uh, we are we are living in uh, we can you know fight with words and say this dictatorship and that and all uh, in this country given the system that we have from small days we have a certain way people are not self disciplined right if the teacher is there in your class only the children will behave if the principal is there in the school only the children will behave yeah. right so it goes the same way if the boss is there only certain officers the the people will really work so it's it's worst in the worst in the government sector uh, so i have been talking to act, uh, actually uh, when i'm doing these trainings on social entrepreneurship to the women uh, that uh, who has got these houses 
and who has got these uh, boutiques at the theater you know so they're like i asked like uh, how did you get this right how do you see all these things so they're like uh, we are not even from that party so they didn't even ask which party we are from uh, and i actually we did a, a full study to understand we we interviewed all the people who were involved in the process of removing these shanties so uh, the process the vision that he had uh, he didn't want to just to give a house without even uh, road access or without even a, a uh you know all the sanitary uh, facilities uh, but he wanted to create an environment where it will be a, a, com a complete uh, set of facilities from playgrounds to the children uh, from uh, walking paths and everything so uh, uh, getting something done is not dictatorship so if we try to label everyone who's getting done the work as a dictator we won't be able to go uh, further in this country so we have seen that during the last four and a half years right so a party uh, who who cannot uh, remove their leader constitutionally because they're stuck with the constitution in the party uh, cannot talk about a democracy more than that i guess <laughs> if you could address uh, the claims with regards to what the state should be doing to bring in bringing in more women into politics maybe bring into bringing them in bringing them come into more decision making roles what do you, what do you see the state should be doing apart from bringing in quotas yeah uh, so actually uh, this has to start uh, from the education system itself mm -hmm. it has to be a very systematic way right uh, so actually yeah, recently at the SLPP uh, women's convention mr gota be rajapaksha uh, touched upon these concepts uh, so from the education system itself we have to start grooming uh, leaders so it doesn't have to be discriminated as women or uh, men mm -hmm. right uh, so or every child has to have their capacity to uh, come into politics or whatever the uh, uh, you know field that they want right so it can be construct uh, construction it can be teaching it can be education it can be politics so recently i i met a child who was in the a level class uh, so i was asking from everybody what are your aspirations so there was a girl who said i want to become the president of sri lanka so i asked like are you just kidding me no she was like yeah i do i do one day uh, but i don't know whether i have the uh, i have the uh, support system in this country to become that but i would do that right so we have to have a system very systematically like if you take singapore they are uh, uh, grooming their ministers from grade 5 scholarship uh, exam Uh, starting from there right so um, in our country also we have to have a proper system so at the moment uh, what is lacking is where as and when a government changes the policies are changing mm. yes. right mm -hmm. so we have to have a system very solid it shouldn't change the system should go on irrespective of whoever the political party or the leadership who's coming in mm -hmm. so there is a lot in the hands of the people who are working for the government right and who are in the education system and uh, uh, especially the even the parents right mm -hmm. so sometimes parents uh, they would uh, groom their son in a different way and groom their daughter in a different way or politics you don't have to talk about that right mm -hmm. but the son of course you can talk about anything so we have to change the systems and perceptions and it has to be a gradual system mm -hmm. so apart from the quota i think that has to happen uh, very uh, uh, in a visionary way mm -hmm. we need to move to lehini as well with regards to uh, what the state should be doing to bring yeah. in more women to politics and to more decision making uh, positions before that we'll go for a short break stay tuned this is get real you are back on get real Lini we heard a lot 
And a conclusion with regards to the education system from Sharmila with regards to that being a core component, yes. something that people should be paying attention to. Um, if you could, in a more conclusive note, tell us exactly what the state's position should be in empowering women mm -hmm. and to bringing in that vote for a reasonable cause, mm -hmm. given they award you that mandate. And if Sharmila also could uh, uh, give in an input with regards to this. When they give in that mandate to you as a state in the event mm -hmm. uh, you do plan on making government next f from this election, what, what should be those key concerns? What should the but to the people, the women specifically, push their presidential candidates to achieve? Yeah. So I would say, in a broader sense, women's, whichever the government comes, women's issues need to be addressed. Now, for example, uh, at, at the moment, we don't have a women's rights bill. We have ratified the CEDAW Convention, but it has not been converted to a law. There are NGOs that are working, uh, inside, in, NGOs are working, the ministry is working, but all these units, not just to e evaluate the CEDAW report, but they need to come together in terms of bringing in action for women. Women's issues in terms of sexual abuse, in terms of cyber harassment for, issue, uh, for women, in terms of sexual uh, issues that happen at workplaces, in terms of, uh, I would say, teen pregnancy, malnutrition, mm -hmm. then uh, maternal mortality rates, then in terms of women entrepreneurship, then gender discrimination, public harassment to women, all these things are severe issues that are that, that face women. And also the, in terms of healthcare, you know, we talk about maternity leave, what about paternity leave? Nobody talks about these factors. So and also about educating the children, the prepubertal role that women play in educating children while being career mothers. Women are mothers, they manage their household plus their career. So in terms of establishing and giving more support to women, in terms of opening more daycares, in terms of opening more creches. So things like that, how do we support this woman to, how do we mobilize this woman to come into a more decision making, to come participate more in governance. So I think the state per se has a pivotal role in supporting this woman. If women are not supported, women cannot, because women has to balance multiple roles, doesn't mean we Women are incapable. Women can, but women women hold a greater fort. No, I'm not. Dis I'm not. I'm not discounting the fact of a man, but women hold this. But together with that, they can be a pivotal role in the whole decision-making process. But the state also, to a larger extent, needs to support these women. So, uh, in terms of now, we have the women's charter, but the women's commissions need to be established. The rights bills, rights uh, bills of rights for women, all those things, regulations need to be, I would say, far more stronger and looking uh, to strengthen the woman. So, so in if if that whichever the government comes. That that is uh, that I would say is a pivotal role, and if also in terms of uh, contributing and helping women to come into politics. So as I said, uh, politics women it's it's the whole conventional route of awarding nominations to women. But can it go another step? Can women be awarded political uh, nominations because they are capable, because of because they are good, because they can contribute to decision making, because they they are they are stronger, and because they have the knowledge? Can can the government can can policymakers can the parliamentarians look at things in that in that tie? So these are things that we need to uh, debate and look in a broader sense because women, I would say, they not only can lead with brains but they can lead with hearts also because women are empathetic, women understand issues, and um, and so I would like to say also women who are watching this. If you if you you expect change, everybody expects change. Everybody blames the present government, the past governments, the 225 that is in parliament. But if you want change, be the change. Talk about politics. Talk about politics in your household. Talk about politics with your peers, with your friends. Don't politics should not be a stigma. Decision be, being contributory to decision making should not be a stigma. You should take that bold step and come forward. If if women, if more and more capable women come into this, yes, we can change the system. I think we need to take this from six percent to I would say at least a minimum of twenty percent initially through the quota but thereafter not through the quota but we may need to come and work so that women will be contributory factors in decision making going forward. Mm -hmm. Shamila if you could also give us a conclusive note and if I could ask you the same question what would a country Sri Lanka 2025 uh, 20, look like to you what would you like it to look like? Um, so I want it to be uh, a suitable place to live for my family and my child. 
so I think that's uh, the dream of every mother, right? Without a fear, uh, without having to think of, do we have to migrate to another country? Or like sometimes I always tell my husband here and there, we better apply somewhere and keep for PR in case if the, this gets worse, like we have to go, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I think uh, we, we shouldn't be in that uh, dilemma, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we have to uh, live in this country. Uh, we love this country. But uh, most of the people are leaving the country because they're being forced to leave the country. All the educated people uh, who are talented and who have good brains, uh, they're leaving the country, right? Uh, but we have to keep our talent in our country. We have to preserve our, our resources for this country. And we have to build up a country for our future generations. So uh, what I would say, as Lihini said, the system, the political system, right? So uh, as I said in 2015, when I realized that things are not going well, I started uh, talking on social media. I started raising my voice on my Facebook. So all of a sudden, then a whole heap of my friends are messaging me privately, uh, why are you talking? talking like aren't you afraid don't talk in public right because we have this barricade right uh, so like they're like don't talk like uh, what will happen to your career like people won't accept you right so that is why women are backward because they don't want to be judged I know even some men they're not talking they're not coming out and expressing their opinion because they are scared of being judged and I agree with that because sometimes when I go and I talk, or whoever who talks, right, people label you, right? Now I'm talking for uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha. I, I, I like his policies and I, uh, I follow him and I, I uh, second him. Uh, so then people will label me as, you know, whatever it is. Sometimes they ask, oh, you're a Rajapaksha, right? <laughs> um, uh, so people label you. That is our society, our culture. So I would say now everyone is blaming the parliament, the state, right? What people are forgetting is we are the state not the 225 parliamentarians. We are the, we, we, are the are the, we are the people. We are formulating, we are representing the state. So we have to start, as Lini also very correctly said, we have to be the change, right? So start your change from your home, right? Uh, uh, people can't engage in a, a healthy conversation without calling others' names. Sometimes, you know, on Facebook, sometimes you get into a conversation with somebody, when they don't, they run out of uh, uh, points, they start calling you names. Mm -hmm. And especially I have seen for women. Now, sometimes I go and comment. Sometimes it can be a UNP uh, MP or a CMC member. Recently, there was an incident in Nigambo. Mm -hmm. So people were commenting on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So people were calling her names. And I said, cyber like, harassment. Cyber, cyber harassment. harassment. I'm like, merely because she's a woman, you start by calling her the worst name, right? So she's not that. Mm -hmm. Like, criticize her. Objectively. We Objectively. should come to that whole forum where people can talk objectively, objectively without labeling right? it. Right? Mm -hmm. So the thing is, we are setting the wrong example. Mm -hmm. you, you take TV shows, right? Political debates, and you take parliament, right? Most of them just can't talk in the normal tone, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes my daughter asks, like, why do they have to shout? Why are they shouting? Right? Can't they just talk to each other nicely? Right? right? So we have to change that culture. It's not only the state. State, yes, of course, they have to do uh, big uh, policy uh, changes mm -hmm. and procedural changes. Uh, but the system has to change. And people have to mm -hmm. uh, realize that the system comprises all of us. Mm -hmm. So everyone has to change in this country. Okay. So then it will be a nice world. Uh, 2025 will be a greater world for all the children and women and all the men in this country. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to end our discussion there. I would like to thank Sharmila Rajapaksha, who is a member of the Vyatmag Initiative. And I'd like to also thank Atanyat Law Lini Fernando, who is a member of the Mortua Municipal Council. That is all from us today here on behalf of the team at Adderno24 and Getria. I would like to thank everyone for watching. I'm Dhanidu Thanwasam. Mahesh Johnny will be back next week. Join us then. Thank you and have a good night.